हरि ओ गजानन भूतगणातिशे विधम कविधुंभो बल सारक्षित उमासुद शोख विनाशकारण नमा विघ्नेशर पादपंकज ओ गजानन महाकाय विघ्नराज विनायक विश्व विश्वशक्ष गणेशा नमो नम ओ ज्ञानदमय देव निर्मलस्फटिखात्रुधि आधार सर्व अयग्रीव मुस्मे यद्रध्या पिषत परशतम विघ्न निघ्न सतत विश्वश्रेम तमाश्रिए गुरब्रह्म गुरुर्ष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरुर्साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुर नम गुरवे सर्वोकाना विसजे भवरोगिनदे सर्विद्या दक्षिणाथ नम हरि ओं तत्सत्री तयीश्वरधुनमस्तु योगेन चित्तस्य पदे नवाचाम मलम शरीरस्य च वैद्यकेना यो पाकरोत प्रवरा मुनीना पथाजलि प्राजलिरान तो आबाहुपुषाक शिधारिण सहस्रशीर्षम श्वेत तम नमा पथाजलि हरि ओं तत्सत्री योगीश्वर अर्पणमस्तु Sairam, and welcome back to our series on the significance of the Yoga Sutras. And obviously, due to the you know unavoidable and untimely passing of my mother, we had to stop it for a while, five weeks, I think. But. thank you to the divine energies and the divine forces for yet again allowing us to continue with uh you know with this uh for the remainder period so we move on we we are still in the second book um i think middle of next week we'll finish the second book and we'll go into the third book which is the vibhuti pada right so today we'll look at 14 verses towards the tail end of the second book hari <clears> om <throat> now well, in verse 34 patanjali's aim was to induct the yogin or the yogini into the powers of how you can you know control your mind to move away from moha vasanas or desires right so in verse 34 he says vitharka himsadaya kritakarita anumodita loba 
ಕ್ರೋಧ ಮೋಹ ಪೂರ್ವಕ ಮೃದು ಮಧ್ಯ ಅತಿಮಾತ್ರ ದುಃಖ ಅಜ್ಞಾನ ಅನಂತ ಫಲ ಇತಿ ಪ್ರತಿಭಾಕ್ಷ ಭಾವನ ಸೊ ಬೇಸಿಕ್ಲಿ ಇಸ್ ವಿಥಾರ್ಕ ವಿಥಾರ್ಕ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಡೌಟ್ಸ್ ರೈಟ್ ಹಿಂಸಾ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಹಿಂಸಾ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ವೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಹಿಂಸಾ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ನಾನ್ ವೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಹಿಂಸಾದಯ ಸೊ ವೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅದರ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ರಿಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಟು ವೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಐ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಸೇಡ್ ವೈಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅ ಫಿಸಿಕಲ್ ಮ್ಯಾನಿಫೆಸ್ಟೇಷನ್ ರೈಟ್ ಥಾಟ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ವೈಲೆಂಟ್ words can be violent and obviously when the thoughts and the words are violent it will ultimately manifest in violent acts so he's saying doubts which is vitarka himsadaya anything related to violence and which is done or which is going to be done krita karita right and if you sort of endorse doing it right if you approve of that behavior which relates to anything related to violence or doubts then such things like lobha greed krodha anger moha delusion right purvaka means which is caused by doubts basically and the doubts it doesn't matter right doubts have got no characteristics whether is mrudu madhya adimatra that means you know <laughs> small medium large in other words right minor mediocre or substantial what happens it it causes dukkha distress agnana agnana means spiritual ignorance right ananta phala and the results are endless in this so he is saying iti all of these pratipaksha bhavana that means change it around and go to the opposite basically this verse means doubts which produce violence anything related to violence which are performed done or caused to be done which are endorsed and approved which are caused by things like you see he's talking about doubts and violence now he's saying what is causing these doubts or violence which is caused by greed lobha anger delusion it doesn't matter whether it's a minor doubt or minor violence medium doubt or medium violence or substantial doubt or significant violence it causes endless distress and results in spiritual ignorance therefore itihi pratipaksha bhavana that means one should consider the opposite features so if he's talking about lobha which is greed then consider the opposite which is compassion or dhana which is charity krodha anger consider the opposite means being peaceful being calm so he's saying the way to tackle this see he identifies the problem first and then he gives you the the way out of it it's just like when you go and consult a doctor right they will diagnose what is the problem first before they give you the medication right here the great maharishi patanjali identifies diagnoses and gives you you know what you should do gives you the medication and the treatment as well see because he is very clear uh, he is very clearly saying that violence and related actions run opposite or run contrary to moral restraints moral restraints such as non violence realism you know all those good qualities like when i did the ramayana with you right um some time back i spoke to you about the 16 qualities of rama that absolutely encapsulates you know what is moral restraints so patanjali in verse 34 is saying any idea which runs contrary to morality right seems to justify immoral acts and that is what you need to abandon you see if you are treading the path of spirituality and you find that you are finding it very difficult to abandon immoral acts you know all kinds of the doshas then you should think about the benefits of morality and maybe the benefits can influence your thinking little by little so that you move away from those immoral activities to moral activities 
So he's very clear in that. He said, this, when you think about that, it may give you the sense of detachment or the required amount of detachment and invoke in you, you know, some feeling of wanting to move away and restrain yourself from these type of vices so that these type of physical violence does not enter your mind and, you know, fully occupy the mind and then, you know, control the mind. And he's saying it begins with the doubt. It begins with the doubt. This is exactly the same question. Again, when I did Bhagavad Gita, I told you, you know, in chapter one, it's all about Arjuna's delusion. And also, you know, chapters in other chapters, it was all his questions that Krishna was answering, but it's a lesson to man, you know. Um, further to some explanations given to Arjuna by Krishna, I, I feel in, in chapter three, Arjuna was still asking questions. And this is relevant to what verse 34 is all about, right? So in, in chapter three, Arjuna asks Krishna, Yam papam charati purushaha anichan api varshneyaha. He's saying, then explain, O oh family man of the Vrishnis, by what is a person forced to commit an evil act, even though he is unwilling, just as if he were compelled to do so. And then Krishna says, there is a difference between having a choice and choosing not to do and being compelled to do something on the basis of dharma. You don't have a choice because as a Kshatriya, it is your dharma to defend what is right. And I have taken birth to, inf to, to, to infuse this right righteousness. Right? So he says to Arjuna, Yato dharmaha tato krishnaha, yato krishnaha tato jayaham. So he says, whenever you act righteously, Krishna is always present. Remember this. He says, whenever you act righteously, righteously means having a moral code. Moral code means moral conduct, behavior. Right? Within the spiritual definition, if you like. So yato dharma tato krishnaha, where there is dharma, right, right, right actions, right conduct, there is Krishna and Yatho Krishna Tatho Jayam. And wherever there is Krishna, there is only victory. Who is here? You are here. Who is here? Krishna is here. I am riding your, I, I am, I am, I am your charioteer. So what else can there be except for victory? So have faith in the dharma because the dharma will bring Krishna to you. And when Krishna comes to you, there is only victory. I mean, nothing can be more powerful right, as a statement of fact and as a statement of authenticity given by Krishna to Arjuna here. So I don't see why anyone reading this, hearing this, and having read, understanding this, has a problem of devising a moral code for themselves. Everybody is different, right? Some people have a very stringent, have a more disciplined outlook. Some have a very relaxed approach. Develop your own moral code. But it has to be a moral code to which you subscribe and to which you, uh, you know, behave within those uh, restraints that you draw. Then, yes. But otherwise, it's difficult, isn't it? Hmm? So, and in verse 35, he goes on to explain. Ahimsa tatishthayam tat sannidhau vairat tyagaha. He says, ahimsa is, of course, non-violence. You know, earlier in 34, he says, Himsadaya, right? Vitarka himsadaya. You know, doubts come as the result of violent thoughts. Violent thoughts can be anything like why, you know. Doubts can even uproot an entire, you know, oak tree. That is the power of doubts because it just grows, 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 grows. So doubts never decrease. They only increase. And that is the characteristic of doubt. So he's now saying in 35, how you can overcome this doubt, vitartha, and himsa, violence. Again, violence in the three levels, right? Conscious, subconscious, superconscious, physical, mental, and <clears throat> spiritual, right? Mind, body, spirit, which is yoga.
So he's saying ahimsa, which is non-violence. Pratishthayam. When pratishtham means what we call uh, consecration. That means being established. Tat sannidhau. In his presence. Then vairatyaga is where you abandon hostility towards these, you know, ahimsas. So on being firmly established in the practice of non-violence, that means non-violence again in your thinking, non-violence in your speaking, and non-violence in your actions. Patanjali says, when you are firmly established in the act of non-violence, the abandonment of hostility easily happens because he is present. Because non-violent is dharma. And what did I say earlier? Yato dharma tato krishna. Yato krishna tato dhyam. So, sometimes this, uh, you see great yogis and rishis, right? They will show you that they are not affected by the violent nature of others. So if you go to a rishi or if you go to a, you know, a sadhu, they are not bothered by who is in front of them. It can be uh, a, a very noble person, a very humble person, a morally defined person, or it can be a crook, a robber, a murderer and all. They are not affected by the characteristics of the thought process and the personality of the person in front of them because they are vibrating at a different level. But normal human persons are not like that. They are so disturbed and taken by the quality of the person right in front of them. So he's saying, establish this non-violent. He's basically talking about, you know, if you want a modern terminology, he's talking about stigmatization. Yeah, stigmatization. So the first thing he's telling you to develop is non-violent in your thought. That means do not judge anybody. That is not your job. It is not your job to judge. But I am always being judged. Okay. Establish your actions in Dharma. In your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. And who will judge you? You see, you must understand one thing. No matter what you do, how good you are or how bad you are, people will still judge you because that is the nature of man. Remember, the entire spiritual exercise is to move you away from man to divine, manusha to purusha. So if you want to move, then you must move away from the characteristics that verily define man. And beautifully, he's saying here in verse 35, ahimsa pratishthayam. Tat Sannidhau in his presence. How do you get his presence? Prayer, meditation, silence. Focus on him. And say, I surrender all my negative qualities. Guard me, guide me, take me with you. So, Ahimsa Pratishthayam Tat Sannidhau in his presence. Then Vairatyagaha. You will abandon all these little hostilities from time to time, from time to time. Because if you don't, right? You know, if you don't do something on a regular and consistent basis, then that void, that absence, creates more problems for you. A simple act, you know, even a clean house is swept every day. So you sweep, it becomes clean, right? But the next morning you sweep again. Maybe evening you sweep again. You know, in most households they clean the house. You know, throughout the day they're cleaning. Why? Because if you don't clean, dust will accumulate, right? Dirt will accumulate. Similarly, if the mind is not cleansed consistently, continually, constantly, dust will accumulate and dirt will accumulate, right? This is why. Japa mala is necessary. You know, jap mala. Jap means to repeat. Mala means to remove dirt. How do you remove the dirt? Dirt means all the negative thoughts. Kama, krodha, loba, moha, mara, mamada, matsira, hamkar. All these thoughts, in order to remove them, that is mala. Japa mala means to remove dirt by the constant repetition of the name of God. Hence, you do it one or eight times. 
And I've explained the significance of 108 many times. Maybe in some time in one of these sessions, I'll explain it again. So firmly establish yourself in the acts of nonviolence so that you abandon any thought of hostility towards this nonviolence. It's a fantastic thing. You know, sometimes we are, um, what's the word? We are influenced by the presence of someone in front of us. So I give you a simple example, right? You go to some ashram. It can be Puttapati or it can be, you know, anywhere. Or you go to, you know, uh, see other gurus in, in, in their abodes, you know. The moment you go there, you feel a sense descending upon you that for the time that you are there in that ashram, in the presence of that guru or master or acharya, you have to be vegetarian. And you do become vegetarian for that few days that you are there. But the moment you leave that sense of presence of that place, back to your old, back to your old self, back to your old habits. So you want to go and look for, you know, the kind of food that you are usually accustomed to. Isn't it? Ah, so here is what he's saying. The moment you continuously, consistently, and constantly keep your mind occupied in the presence of that divine energy, you will not give place for other things to go in there. You know your life, you know your your contra, your you know your commitments, so you know how you spend your time daily. So spend your day, plan your day, and spend your day accordingly. Right? So think of God, you don't need to spend a specific time to do that. You just think. That's why they say Tat Sannidhau in his presence, you know. And he goes on to explain in verse 36, 34, 35, 36. You see, this uh, 14 verses that I'm talking to today is all about how to turn the mind inward from outward sensory perceptions. Fantastic. Fantastic. Satya Pratishthayam Kriya Palasrayatvam Verse 36. Satya, of course, is truth for what is real. Itihi Satya You know, like that. Pratishthayam, again, on consecrating that satya or the value of truth which is as you know one of the five human values kriya means actions right that which you do phala pal as in results or fruits asyatvam that means what uh, can serve or substantiate as support you know that which supports something else so here he's saying, on firmly being established in truth. See, earlier in 35, he said, on firmly being established in nonviolence. Here he's telling, on firmly being established in truth, your actions that is based on truth will serve, asyatvam, will serve or substantiate the basis of the results that you will enjoy. Very clear. Satyam vadha dharmam chara rigveda. Always speak the truth, always act righteously. So not only the Vedas have said it, you know, the Upanishads have said it. I did Upanishads with you, right? I did 15 Upanishads with you and 18 Puranas. And where we've gone through this, you know, captions of universal relevance and universal timelessness. So it is not surprising that they are cropping up yet again in the Yoga Sutras. So what does that tell you? When the same thing is repeated in many different references, it tells you that that is a irrefutable fact. Irrefutable. Right? If the Veda is the very sanctified, you know, uh, what do you call, reference for Hinduism, then it is saying, Satyam Madha Dharmam Chara. Always speak the truth, always act righteously. What more do you need? So your, your actions serve as the basis of your results, right? So if untruth is your action, the result would be that which comes from untruth. So very easily he's you know connecting the dots here. He's saying 
non-violence will lead you somewhere. Truth will also lead you to the same place. Non-violence and truth will lead you faster to that place. Right? Because some people will say, oh, what is truth to you may not be truth to me. No, no. What is truth is truth in any circumstance. How you interpret may be different, but truth is truth. It is irrefutable. Hmm? So you must establish your life on non-violence and on truth. Going to 37, he goes on to say, Asteya Pratishthayam. Asteya Pratishthayam. Sarvarat, sarvarat no Right? Sarva Ratna Upasthana. Right. Asteya Pratishthayam Sarva Ratna Upasthanam. That means, Asteya means not stealing, you know, thieving, and that sort of thing, right? Just having what is yours or getting what you have rightfully, righteously. If you live According to this, if you pratishthayam, if you consecrate and establish this as a principle of your life, then sarva ratna, all the ratna is gems, right? All the precious things. Upasthanam, upa means coming, sthanam means will come to you, right? Upasthanam, sarva ratna upasthanam, on firmly being established in non-stealing as a character, all precious things are waiting to serve you. Wow. That means right contact, isn't it? Dharma. Dharma, right contact means you don't steal. You don't lie, you don't steal. So you see, first he starts with ahimsa, non-violence. Then he talks about satya, absolute truth. Now he's talking about asteya, which is dharmic quality, non-stealing. And stealing can mean not just physical things, right? You steal people's thoughts and you claim it to be yours. You steal people's words and you claim it to be yours. And you steal people's actions and you claim it to be yours. So theft can happen in many levels. But theft is theft. That means claiming something, taking something, appropriating something that is not yours. That is theft. However, you want to justify it, that it doesn't belong to you. So you don't have to have it. Okay. okay. And again, you know, whilst you are in the company of these uh, holy people or divine people or, you know, in the ashramas, you want to. You want to be uh, non-violent. You want to speak the truth. You want to act dharmically. You want to eat vegetarian or even vegan. You want to do all of that, but that because your mind is temporarily latched to those things. Here he's saying, firmly establish, not temporarily establish. Pratishthayam. You know, like when they build the temple, they do Pratishthavanaha. That means they once they install, that installation is complete and for time immemorial. And then every 12 years, they do the Kumbhavishekam, right? So in yoga is prana pratishtha banaha. Now, through breath, you establish these things. So that is 37. Asteya pratishthayam. Now he goes on to explain. You see, it is, as I said to you before, it is beautifully linked, right? If you don't understand one thing, then he gives you another example. If you don't understand, he gives you another example, right? So at some point, everything will come and, you know, gel together as one picture. You will see the complete picture, which you perhaps may not have seen when, you know, you, you, you think, oh, this is a bit confusing, you know. Now, in verse 38, he's telling, Brahmacharya Pratishthayam Viryalabha. Brahmacharya means, you know, celibacy, right? If at some point you must understand, right? That is why the ashrama say, first, you are Brahmacharya, and then you go to Grahastha. And then the third stage is Vana Pratishta, and then fourthly, Sanyasa. But to go to Sanyasa, you must practice Brahmacharya. That means move away from the Grahastha stage. That means, you know, um, 
moving away from you know uh, sexual desires or sexual tendencies. Perception is spirituality. So Brahmacharya means that. Pratishtayam, as I said, firmly established this practice of Brahmacharyam of moving away from these Mohavasanas, right, which is sex-based. Um, then he says, if you do this, if you Pratishtabanaha Brahmacharyam, then Virya Labaha. Virya means vigor, the spiritual vigor. Labaha means that which is you, but that which you gain. So on firmly being established in non-expressiveness, which is sexual in nature, you result in the spiritual perception through vigor, spiritual vigor, right? So the celibacy has to be dynamic, obviously, right? By practice of the yogic practices, yogic teachings, in terms of asanas, you know, postures, and I told you in the Ashtanga yoga, right? First is what? Yama, Niyama, then asana, right? Then only pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, eight, ashtanga yoga, right? So here you can establish dynamic celibacy through different asanas, through posts, through different mudras. I've been giving you mudras. I'll give you one today as well, right? So pranayama, you can do that in different Levels of breathing can also control your you know, sexual expressiveness. Uh, nutrition, you know, can also control that, you know, the kind of food you eat, right? Um, and of course, to do this, you have to also look at your chakras. And of course, the practice and continuous and consistent practice of yoga will allow you to align your chakras and also in that pursuit of aligning your chakras allow you to master the kundalini, right? The moment you master the kundalini, the celibacy won't be a problem at all, right? This is called the Udvaretha stage in the kundalini yoga. Udvaretha stage in kundalini yoga. Okay, so 38, he's talking about brahmacharya. So, so far, what has he said? Four things he has said, right? He said, Ahimsa, Satya, Dharma, or Asteya, and of course, Brahmacharya. Then, what else is he saying? In, in the next one, he is saying, <coughs> 39, what is he saying? Apari Grahasthaya, Janma Kathamtha Sambodaha. What is he saying? Apari Graha. Apari Graha means, Non, the quality of non-possessiveness, the characteristic of non-possessiveness. Sthairya means that means cons consistency. Janma means birth. Katamta, what does that mean? Katamta means the reason for, right? The reason for. And then sambodaha means a correct perception about something, right? Your opinion about something, perception about something, your view about something, your opinion about something, right? So basically, in being consistent in non-possessiveness, so this is the fifth quality is given. Being non-possessive, there is a manifested reason and correct perception about the reason for your birth. Why have you taken this janma? Kathamta janmaha, right? That means why have you been born? So here he's saying, you will get the sambodha, the correct perception of why you were born when your life is firmly established in the quality and character of non-possessiveness. How oh, fantastic he has put this. See, when a yogi or a potential yogi masters the quality of non-possessiveness, this is not mine. This is not yours. You are temporarily enjoying it in the name of ownership. If today you go, you are so proud of the new car. You buy, you drive, you know, you show your friends, you tell your friends everything, my car, my car, my car. Boom, something happens. You know, you can't drive, I don't know, maybe something you're on a wheelchair or, you know, um, car is still there. You can't touch it, you can't drive it, you can't do anything to it. But the moment you have something and you don't claim it, you don't live in the thing. You use it for your life, but you don't live 
in the quality of possessing it, non-possessiveness, right? Then your energy of appreciation shifts from possessiveness to a subtle reality of everything is the universe. Everything belongs to the universe. See, before you bought the car, the car was already there. Just it came to you at a time when you had the resources to buy it and own it and keep it and use it. But it will still be there after you. So why must you claim this is mine and mine only? But you must change. So Patanjali here beautifully says, Aparigrahastaivye. The moment you establish yourself consistently in the quality of non-possessiveness, the reason for your birth manifests itself. Okay. Yeah. You want dhanam, which is wealth, then establish yourself in the quality of dhana, charity, because only when there is dhana, you get dhanam. 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 Dhanyam. Right? Give. In giving, you receive. Okay? So you must have that, uh, that sense of thinking practically. If you are obviously interested in the path of, you know, uh, attaining some spiritual realization or, you know, changing your level of spiritual awareness from one stage to another stage and then developing that and evolving from that stage to yet a higher stage, then you have to do these things, right? Gradually, slowly, but definitely you have to do it. You understand? Okay, so think of all the things that I have said, right? Non, non, um, non-violence, uh, truth, uh, asteya, dharmans, non-stealing, then brahmacharyam, now aparigraha. Then he goes on. When you get all this, you know, when you get the results as a result of practicing non-violence, you know, uh, truth, uh, dharma, um, non-possessiveness, uh, celibacy, what happens? So now he's explaining. From the purification that takes place as a result of these things, saucha, swangha, jugupsa, parayar, asam, sargaha, He's saying, Sauchat means from the purification. Swangha Jugupsa, you know, from oneself. Jugupsa means, you know, you, you move away, right? The purification that one, one gets makes him to move away from the others who have that sort of desires. Asam Sargaha. From purification comes a disgust to associate with people who are still having those kind of, you know, upavasanas. Okay? He's telling you, once you develop that, you will not associate yourself with people who can bring you back to those levels of, you know, to take you back to those kind of situations or sense of presence. And this doesn't come easy. You must be consistent. When the student has earned the purity of his own psyche, that's why I said mind, body, and spirit. You cannot cleanse your mind without first starting with your mind. You cannot cleanse your body without first cleansing the mind. Only the mind can lead to the clean body, and both mind and body can lead to mind, body, and soul. Can that. Right? So the material body is only an asset to you as long as it exists. So it says, move away from the gross to the subtle. Because the gross can perish, but the subtle doesn't perish. The subtle is energy. Even. That's why they call yoga siddha. Right? But we are all so focused and so concentrated on the material body that, you know, we never focus on the subtle energies. So here he's telling, once you purify yourself to non-violence, to truth, to dharma, to brahmacharya, to aparigraha, then you should develop 
that disgust to associate yourself. So you will you will acquire the quality to dissociate yourself with those kind of people. So you will look for these kind of places where you can go and further go. Right? So it's very, very important for, for us to realize that. Yeah. Now, 41, he goes on to say, Sattva Suddhi Saumanasya Eka Graha Indriya Jayatma Darshana Yogatvani. Sattva means, you know, Sattvik. Sattva means your, your, your pure nature, if you like. Suddhi is purification. Saumanasya, that means one that becomes benevolent. Eka Graha means or oh, ekagra means you, your thinking is one pointed, right? Concentration is singular. Indriya jaya, that means your indriyas, you know, your senses or the energy that directs your senses. Uh, jaya is, of course, victory. Atma is spirit. Darshana is sight, vision, perception. Yoga, when it means being fit for yoga or meditation. So what it basically means is purification. You see, in the earlier one, he talks about purification, right? He says purification of your psyche. Psyche means gross and subtle. Hmm? Results in benevolence. It results in the ability to link, to link the attention of one to concentration or conquest of the sensual energy. It will lead one not to just to conquer that sensual energy, but to have the vision of the spirit and to develop a fitness for abstract meditation. Meditation. So it will say this would be the result of purification. Sattva Suddhi. Sattva Suddhi is purification of the psyche. It will lead to detachment. It will lead to applying your newfound purification to control your sensual energies, to envision the spirit, and to prepare yourself for meditation. So you go into Dhyana Loka. Right? Once you master that, then you're already in the fifth stage. Huh? Mastering the sensual energies and envisioning the spirit, you're in Pratyahara. Pratyahara is the fifth stage. Remember? Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama. Pratyahara. So he's telling you once you do this, you'll be at this stage. Then dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So already five stages you've mastered. It's very good. Right? And what does he say in verse 42? He goes on to say, Santosha anuthamaha sukha labaha. Santosha means santosha from happiness, contentment, you know, comes. Anuthama. And that Anuthama is, Anuthama means the best, the supreme, the highest stage. Sukha Labaha. So from contentment, Santosha, contentment, the very best of happiness or stage of being happy is obtained. So he's saying once you're at that level of purified sense of the mind that descends to your speech, that then descends to your actions and all your kriya. Kriya karmas, you know, everything that you do. But this type of calmness where you are in that, you know, balanced state of happiness, it devoids all the usual excitations which come from the pursuit of desire or craving. Vices, if you like. Right? And yogis <clears throat> come to this stage and nothing moves them, you know. Nothing is, this is the Buddha, you know. Nothing moves him. He is neither happy nor is he sad. He is neither, uh, you know, um, this or that. Everything is the same for him. Because he has gained the quality of Aparigraha. That means he is not, not possessive of anything. Something good is not mine. Thank the universe. This is gratitude. Something happens good, not my doing, because I may have done something physically in my role, in my janmakhatma, right? In my birth, there's something I have to do, I do, but 
The result is not mine. This is what Krishna told Arjuna. Just do your actions. I'm telling you to fight. You fight. You don't worry about the results. Leave that to me. That's why everything is Sarvam Krishna Arpanam. So if Arjuna can follow that and be victorious, why can't you and I be? Verse 42 reaffirms that, reinstates that, reasserts that. Santoshat Anuthama Sukhalabha. From contentment, the very best stage of being blissful is obtained. And yogis, they get this when they are constantly in the practice of purifying their mind. And then, of course, you have um, the next one that says, Khaya Indriya Siddhi Ashuddhi Shayat Tapasa. Khaya means body, right? Deha. Another word is kaya, deha. Indriya means, of course, your senses. Siddhi is skills, you know, yoga siddhis. If you get do yoga continuously, you get siddhis. Ashuddhi means impurity. Shayat means to, to move away or to remove or to eliminate. And tapas, tapas is, of course, austerity. Okay, Austerity results in the elimination of impurity. And the moment you eliminate impurity, it produces perfection in the mind, in the body, and in the spirit. Verse 43 saying that exactly, right? This is the basic results of practicing yama, niyama, asana, pranayama. It will lead you straight away into the fifth stage, which is pratyahara. All impurities are removed. And the stage of Pratyahara, you are able to control these desires and envision spiritual detachment. What more you want? Then you can go into Dharana. Being in that stage continuously, that will take you into deep meditation stages. And the end of that journey is Samadhi, Samadhi, where you energy is exactly the same as the universe. There, you merge with the Supreme. What sub types of yogas? Kundalini yoga? All leads to the same results. So if you choose one path, and this is again a common mistake that a lot of people make, right? You're doing one path. And suddenly some friend or something, someone, you know, somewhere tells you, hey, try this, this is new, very good, you know. Straight away you go into that. So whatever you've built here is wasted. Now you try that for a while. Again, after a few months, you say, okay, I'm trying, it's good. Then, you know, there's no consistency. Remember, every time I say something, I say consistently, continually, and constantly develop. And now practice makes perfect. If you stop it halfway, or, you know, 50%, 60%, you're not going to get the full results, right? So make sure you go into completeness, into one chosen path, right? So, you know, if you look at chapter 6 in Bhagavad Gita, it talks about Atma Shuddha, what you need to do. Chapter 6 is all about Bhakti Yoga, right? It talks about how to clean your, you know, Atma Shuddhi and how to become more tapas based, you know, austere, austere, austere. Verse 44, Swadhyayat Ishta Devata Sampro Yogaha. Sampro Yogaha. Swadhyayat means from the study of the psyche, study of yourself. Ishta Devata, of course, you know, who is your Ishta Devata? And most of you who've been through my meditation, you will know that at one point, I will take you outside the universe and put you in the endless space and say, imagine your Ishta Devata coming. That means whoever you perceive as the Ishta Devata should come before you and bless you. You see the energy coming from his arm, uh, from his hand, sorry, Avaya Mutra, and blessing you. And you see your energy merging with that energy and going back. And then it all dissipates to where it all started from. Take you out from where you are sitting in a hall to that level and then bring you back. So forward and reverse. So here he's saying, Swadhyayat Ishta Devata Samprayogaha. 
from the study of the psyche, see, everything is continuous. First, he talks about the things that can make you pure. pure. Then he talks about what is the result of that purification. Now he's telling you, as the result of that purification, what happens to your psyche. From the study of the psyche comes intimate contact with your cherished divine being, your Ishta Devata. Who is your Ishta Devata? It can be Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Allah, and Swami. You. Because in your mind, that is it. That is the Ishta Devata that should always be resident in the middle of your forehead. Right? Because that Ishta Devata will come before you when that time is right. See, Patanjali is very, very intelligent. He does not say, Swadhyayat Krishna Devata Sampra Yogaha. Swadhyayat Rama Devata Sampra Yogaha. He is saying, Swadhyayat. Ishta Devata Sampro Yoga. How, I mean, how far ahead he was thinking when he wrote this or when he gave this to the world. He said, you, your Ishta Devata, you connect with your Ishta Devata. At the end of the day, they are just a means to the end. They are not the end. They are a means to the end. Whether it's Rama, Krishna, Ganesha, Muruga, Ma, whatever your Ishta Devata, whoever your Ishta Devata is, there is something beyond them. You use them to get there. Once you know what you want, they become a tool. And again, the mistake that we make is we say they are the end. Therefore, you progress no further. So, Patanjali is saying, when you study your psyche, you will make contact with the Ishta Devata. And once you make contact with that Ishta Devata, the end result of that is emergence. You and I become one. So, <laughs> then he goes on to explain in 45. Samadhi Siddhi Ishvara Pranidhana. Samadhi is being you know, continuously linked to that higher energy and emerging, merging with that energy. You emerge and then you merge, right? Siddhi is, of course, level of perfection or, or skills, as I said. Ishwara Pranidhana, I have explained so many times. And one of the uh, Thursday session, uh, Thursday's uh, reflections, you know, I started with Ishwara Pranidhana, you know, the Supreme Lord is found from prana, prana. Prana is your breath. Prana is that which you give. That is breathing in, breathing out. In that breathing in and breathing out, you will see the Ishvara. So Ishvara Pranidhana means one can recognize and develop the Siddhi to merge with their Ishta Devata and become, you know, at the stage where they are fit for Samadhi. Very easily. And Shankaracharya, when he was talking and commenting on the Yoga Sutras, he said, why do we doubt the words of this great Acharya Patanjali when we know he is the incarnation of Adi Shesha, the divine serpentine on which Lord Vishnu resides. And when there was a problem on earth, Vishnu told Adi Shesha, go down as Patanjali and give man yoga sutras to make him come from the stage of manusha to purusha through yoga, dhyana yoga, meditation. Then he goes on to explain. See, because earlier you talked about asanas, right? How you develop your psyche, you go into asanas. He says people are of different makes and models, right? So he's saying sthira sukhamasanam basically means sthira means steady or consistent. Sukham means comfortable. And asana, of course, you know, is posture. So whatever posture you adopt, you have to be comfortable and that has to be steady. I mean, consistent, constant, continuous, right? You can sit in one position. Remember, it's, it's your your... It's you trying to control your mind. So the position that works for one person may not be right for you. So you develop your own position. Right? Sitting, 
standing, squatting, lying down. Develop a posture that keeps your body steady. And because your body is steady, your mind is at ease. The more you practice that same position, the more relaxed. Because the body and the mind works together, isn't it? The mind will say, ah, this, this position means this. Right. Like what you do the moment you get into your motor car, right? Some people will take the seat belt and put first. Some will put the key in the ignition, then take the seat belt. But it's one leads to the other, isn't it? The point is that the moment you do one, the other will come follow suit. So mind and body, here he's saying, sukabhasanam. That means whatever pose you choose, make sure it works for you. And every time you do it, do it in this way. Verse 47, he's talking about uh, <clears throat> what happens when you continuously do that. You know, the pose that you have adopted and adapted for your own self. When the body is at ease, the mind also becomes at ease. When the body is at a state of disease, the mind is also disturbed. So if you're comfortable, the mind is calm. If you're uncomfortable, the mind is distressed. Right? So firstly, calm that body. Right? So I let's say, whenever something happens, remain calm. Right? Then only the mind can be calm. If you're fluttering about in a state of you know panic and things like that, the mind will never be calm. The mind will double, double what it senses from the body. Remember that the mind will double what it senses from the body. So feed the right thing into the mind. Prayatna sthailya ananta sampatibhyam. Sampatibhyam. Prayatna means effort. Saithilya means saithilya means in a state of calmness or in a state of relaxation. Ananta means continuous or endless. Hmm? Nityam. Sense of continuous endlessness. Infinite, if you like. Ananta or nitya. Hmm? Sampatibhyam means when you do something, you meet something, you encounter something, right? So when the body is completely in a state of relaxation, this effort of the mind, of the body being relaxed meets with the infinite relaxation of the mind as well. And asana becomes perfected when it is steady and comfortable. So much so, the moment you get into that position, the mind automatically recalibrates and it goes into that state. So you're shifting your attention, you're shifting your energy, you're shifting your psyche, you're shifting that subtle from the gross, the moment you adopt that pose. That has to be steady and continuous. Right? Now, the mudra that I'm going to give you today is one of the Panchabhuta mudras. It's called Varuna Mudra. Right? Where continuous practice of Varuna Mudra, Varuna is air. Right? And air is what you are made of. You breathe, isn't it? Breathing in, breathing out every day. Your survival depends on your ability to breathe. Breathing depends on prana, air. So Varuna Mudra gives you the power or slowly gives you the power or gradually gives you the power to change pain into power. It gives you the power to become powerful, to make pain become power which you use to evolve, develop, progress. So things to do with uh, blood, for example, uh, anything to do with uh, disease relating to the stomach, anything to do with skin, anything to do with joint pains, any um, illness or disease related to your mouth. And uh, Patanjali even says paralysis right, can be changed slowly, gradually through constant, consistent and continuous practice by using Varuna Mudra. It's very simple. This is your palm. This is your hand. You take the first thumb and you take your last little finger and you meet them both. Right? But obviously, this posture has to be on both fingers and bring it to your 
heart chakra and meditate in the morning. You can put this and you can say Om Sri Krishna, Om Sri Om Sri Sati Sain, whatever your Ishta Devata, right? Say the Amula Mantra. 10 to 15 minutes in the morning, the same. 10 to 15 minutes at night. And you see, right, whether the, the problem that you are focusing on, but you cannot say things like, I want a general wellness and you do Varna Mudra. No, you focus on a problem. Because you are medicating that problem. You are addressing that health issue. You are addressing that disease. So do a sankalpa. I am doing this mudra in the morning, 15 minutes, the night, so that I am trying to address my joint pain. I'm trying to address, you know, some skin disease or whatever the case may be. You know, everyone is different. So daytime, 10 to 15 minutes. And nighttime, 10 to 15 minutes. And see the change in your life. Right? Definitely there will be change. 100% there is a change. Right? Okay. Rahi Om Anyada Sharanam Nasti Tomeva Sharanam Mamaha Smart Karunya Bhavena Raksha Raksha Maheshwaraha Rahi Om Tatsat.